Gotta Catch Em All has been the signature slogan of the Pokemon franchise since its arrival in North America over 20 years ago. And, you know, I never really took it all that seriously. But, with the Diamond and Pearl remakes coming out, I decided that was gonna change. I was gonna take this Gotta Catch Em All motto to heart for once. I wanted to catch all the Pokemon in just one day. I woke up bright and early on release day, downloaded Brilliant Diamond, and started my stream. I rushed with the intro of the game and picked my starter, Chimchar, being the fastest option to speedrun with, and began catching some Pokemon. You're probably thinking right now, well, Wait a minute, how's he gonna complete the Pokedex if he only has one of the three starters? Well, my roommate actually saved the day here. He let me borrow his Switch for the weekend, so I bought Pokemon Shining Pearl and played through the intro two more times on my second Switch. Once for Turtwig, and then for Piplup. I traded him over, and with three starters, I was finally ready to make some progress through the game. I made my way to the first gym, and I'm not gonna bore everyone with every new Pokemon I catch, uh, just the trickier important ones, uh, like Zubat. Because Golbat is a friendship evolution, I made sure to pick up Zubat early, so it can evolve into a Crobat ASAP. And the first badge was pretty trivial. Nearly every Pokemon on my team had super effective moves for Rock, so first badge done. I ran back through Jubilife City, picking up the mystery gift Manaphy Egg along the way, and into Floraroma Town. Uh, my now Monferno, easily handled the Galactic Grunts terrorizing Valley Windworks as I encountered my first major problem of the run, Drifloon. The way Drifloon works is this. The Friday after you defeat Team Galactic and Valley Windworks, it will spawn in the route. Pretty simple, right? Well, the thing is, these games came out on a Friday. Because I beat Team Galactic on a Friday, it wasn't gonna spawn for another week. And that's the only place to find one. It seems like there's an easy solution to that, right? Change the time on your Switch to be the next Friday. Uh, wrong. That, that's not gonna work. For whatever reason, there's a penalty on these games if it detects you've changed the time. If you adjust the time at all, time-based events are paused for the next 24 hours. This means no honey trees, no berries, and no drift loot encounter for 24 hours. I don't have time for that, but I had already thought of this and prepared a solution. Before downloading Shining Pearl on my other Switch, I set the date to 6 p.m. on a Thursday. This gave me just enough time to clear out Valley Windworks on Pearl, then wait until it was Friday on Pearl, and I was able to catch the Drifloon with no time penalty on either game. This was incredibly important, because other time-based events needed to occur, like the Honey Trees. There are a few Pokémon that can appear in Honey Trees. Combi, Cherubi, Burmy, Apom, Heracross, and Munchlax. Some of these Pokémon are very rare. Heracross is a 5% chance, and Munchlax is a 1% chance. And with the honey trees, after spreading honey on them, you need to wait 6 hours before any Pokémon can appear in them. Every single honey tree I could find, I slathered with honey at the earliest opportunity, and set a 6 hour alarm for each one. To complete the Pokédex, I needed to get lucky with these, but I did my best to maximize the odds. Back to Diamond though, I didn't realize it when I had started, but on that switch, the time was actually set wrong for some reason. Uh, so, conveniently enough, I was able to catch a Murkrow in Eternal Forest, a Pokémon usually only able to be caught at night. Another Pokémon I was trying to get around this time was a Dustox. Wurmple, when it evolves, has a random 50-50 chance to evolve into either a Silcoon or a Cascoon. I had already caught a Silcoon, so I only wanted the other one. I evolved one Wurmple. Please be a Cascoon. Please be a Cascoon. Please be a Cascoon. Please be a Cascoon. Please be Cascoon. Damn it! I evolved another Wurmple. Please, I can't tell what it is. Please be Cascoon. Please be Cascoon. Don't waste my time. That's Silcoon number three! And another Wurmple. Cascoon. Oh, that's Cascoon. You can tell by the circle, by the outline. Finally. It's a Cascoon! Yeah, it, it took three tries. But the time I got a Cascoon, I had already defeated the second gym, the galactic base, and dug around underground for a skull fossil. Oh, it's my mom! Mom! Hey, mom! One ethereal sticker C. Cause I know what that means. The third gym was all the way in Veilstone, so after a brief stop in Heart Home to snag the Happini Egg, I entered the city to find that the game corner was missing and replaced with a clothes shop. I updated my style and realized that since gambling was gone, the powerful TMs you can buy with coins in the original games must have been relocated. I found them for purchase in the department store for surprisingly cheap and taught my level 26 Monferno Flamethrower. 
I burned through the third gym without any issue, and there's no story progression between the third and fourth gym, so I strolled directly from the Maylene battle into the wake fight. This fight gave me a little bit of trouble. Monferno barely beat the Gyarados and Quagsire, and there was still Floatzel left, which KO'd Monferno with Aqua Jet. You'd think that with the other starters it'd be a breeze. I... It wasn't. <gasps> Yes! No, because the other starters didn't obey me. Traded Pokemon don't listen to you until you get more badges, and Grottle was able to Leech Seed once, but never attacked again. I just fed it Moomoo Milks until the Floatzel went down, so that was the fourth badge. I jumped into the Great Marsh to grab Defog, and catch a few Pokemon, one of them being my favorite. I'm just gonna run around for a little bit, and we're gonna catch pretty much every- Ooh! There he is! He's not gonna escape. See? It's fate! Whoop whoop! What a good little boy. What a good little fella. I didn't know it yet, but this great marsh was gonna cause great stress later on. I didn't know that there were special Pokémon in the great marsh that change every day. Did you know that only on 16% of days, Carnivine can spawn? And that it's the only place to catch it? I left the Great Marsh, ignorant to the pain that was ahead. I visited Celestic Town to grab Surf. Does Cyrus... I guess Cyrus only attacks you and... Huh. Cyrus only attacks you here in Platinum. Oh! Bopped Fantina with my Infernape and landed in Canalav City and took a boat to see Riley on Iron Island. On Iron Island, I discovered a new mechanic they added to the remakes. <gasps> Toughed it out so I wouldn't feel sad? What does that mean? Have I been guilt tripping this frickin' Infernape? If you die, I'ma be pissed. What kind of friendship is this? That's not how friendship works. Yeah, so that's an interesting addition, I guess. I finished helping Riley out and got the Riolu egg, right as Happiny was hatching. Happiny. Look at the Happiny. Guess what, Happiny? You get to stay in the box forever and never come out. Perfect timing. I had a Baneary that still hadn't evolved by this point, so I took a little detour to the Pokemon Mansion to grab the Sooth Bell to increase friendship later, because I noticed there's a lot of Pokemon that have friendship evolutions this generation. And after that, I decided it was time for the sixth gym. Oh, oh, wait, my alarm went off. That means it's been six hours. It's time to go get the Honey Tree Pokemon. Go, 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 go! Oh, never mind. Time to check the Honey Trees. Here. It's been six hours. As it turns out, there's a chance for the trees to spawn Pokemon after six hours. It's not guaranteed, so I instead needed to periodically check the map for them. In the meantime, I swept through the sixth gym, and with the fifth gym badge, traded Pokemon up to level 70 now obey, so I didn't need to worry about any bad behaving starters anymore. Galactic blew up the lakes, and I left to deal with them. Baneri finally evolved after the Saturn battle. I stopped Mars as well, and departed for Snowpoint. After arriving at Stowpoint, Point, I checked the honey trees again, as it had been another hour, and two were finally ready. Save... yes... We waited six hours for a Wurmple! I checked the second tree, and it was a combi. A, a male combi, unfortunately, so it couldn't evolve. But by resetting the game and trying the battle again, I re-rolled the combi and got a female one on the second try. Resetting doesn't change the Pokemon species, by the way, it just the stats and stuff. Still no Munchlax or Heracross, which was quite scary. There's nothing to do but wait, though. So I returned to Snowpoint to sweep Candace and get that seventh badge. The Veilstone headquarters were next. The battles in there were easy. I wasn't overleveled or anything. It's just that Flamethrower was still hard carrying the run. Uh, next objective was climbing Mount Coronet. I got to the top and the Cyrus battle was harder than expected. His Gyarados was the perfect counter to my team. Not that I had a lot of strong Pokemon, because... 
Uh, I was trying to evolve most of them for the Pokedex. I really only had Empoleon and Infernape. Gyarados took out Empoleon with Earthquake, and Waterfall did a lot to Infernape. No! Uh, Gyarados' special defense is way higher, so that means Flame Wheel should do more. Oh my god! Yeah! <laughs> Okay, yeah, power of friendship and shit. Okay, I never doubted you for a second. Saved by the friendship mechanic once again. With Cyrus defeated, the only thing left on Spear Pillar was catching Dialga. Mm, took about 20 minutes, but I eventually caught it in an Ultra Ball and headed down the mountain to Sunny Shore City. Another easy gym for the 8th badge. At this point, I assessed the Pokedex to see which key Pokemon were still missing. Um, I didn't have Munchlax, Heracross, Apom, or Burmy yet. Four Honey Tree Pokemon. It was not looking good. To get these four, I needed insanely good luck, and there was no way to speed up the trees. Since there was still nothing to do but wait, I figured I'd get another tough one. Spiritomb. In the original games, you needed to place the odd keystone in Spiritomb's tower, then talk to 32 players underground. This could be cheesed by constantly leaving and re-entering the underground. This changed in Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. The way to encounter Spiritomb now is to talk to 32 unique NPCs in the Grand Underground, not other players. These NPCs suck to find. They can randomly spawn in certain designated locations, but sometimes they won't show up for some reason, or one you've talked to will appear there instead. It doesn't really seem like there's a consistent way to find these people quickly. I wandered around the Grand Underground for over three hours. I found only 30 of the 32 needed. This was a soul-crushing experience. Finding a new location only to realize I had already met the NPC there. No. Leilani. Aimlessly walking, only to be disappointed time and time again. Here's Leticia again. I'd been streaming for over 12 hours at this point and was absolutely exhausted. It wasn't until I started checking the hideaways that the tides began to turn. While running around in the Grand Underground, someone in my chat let me know that not all the honey tree Pokemon are exclusive to honey trees. Munchlax and Apom can both be found in these big rooms. So after a few minutes of searching for each, I caught them with relative ease. I didn't just stop at those two though. Apparently the Grand Underground is an amazing place to fill out the Pokedex. The wild Pokemon down there have their levels scaled to how many badges you have. Since I had eight badges, all the Pokemon were level 50 and above. I caught a ton of Pokemon. Skaroopy, Mantike, Luxio, Wingull, and a big one, Gibble. Every one of these being above level 50 allowed me to level them up a single time to evolve them. After catching a Gibble, I had a level 57 Garchomp in a matter of minutes. And not only that, but in Shining Pearl, some honey trees were ready. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Heracross, Heracross, Heracross. Yes! Yes! Oh, that's so good! <laughs> Let's go! Um, now we just need to catch a Burmy and we're good. Bro. <laughs> all right, we got all the Pokemon we needed. I had nearly gotten every difficult Pokemon in the game. With all the Honey Tree Pokemon done, a lot of the stress was gone, but I knew there were still a few key Pokemon left because like I said, I did only find 30 of the 32 NPCs required to encounter Spiritomb. I decided to take a break from the underground to become the champion. Uh, with the underground giving me some pretty high-level Pokemon and Munchlax evolving along the way, I brought an impressive team into the Elite Four. Infernape, Empoleon, Garchomp, Snorlax, Dialga, and Luxray. I also remember that hex items are completely busted, sharply raising your stats while being super inexpensive. I bought a bunch of those and a few healing items. I crushed the Elite Four with ease. Cynthia was another story. I used the last of my X items on Garchomp to set up on the Spear Tomb. Something I noticed during the previous four battles was that although the Pokemon on the teams weren't changed, they had far better movesets and items. It hadn't affected the outcomes of the Elite Four battles until this one. Garchomp took down the Spear Tomb, and Cynthia's Milotic came out next. This thing's probably pretty tough as well. We're gonna dig. Nice try. No! That's not fair! 
It has a ah. Uh, it has marble scale and a flame orb. That's genius. She's actually good. You switch it to Garchomp. Okay, Astrodon. Fair. Is there any way I win this? With zero X items remaining, I knew that her Garchomp was able to one-shot every Pokemon left on my team. I had only one chance. Snorlax. With the few healing items I had left, I set up curses with Snorlax. Snorlax had only one good attacking move, Last Resort. So I had to waste another two turns by using Belly Drum and Flail. On the turn I finally attacked, a miracle happened. Well, last resort. Oh! KO! <laughs> I was able to last resort Gastrodon, Roserade, and Milotic. Oh, we're just gonna have to hope Milotic can't kill me. Oh, man. You lived! Mm! I had zero healing items left, and Garchomp was about to end Snorlax with an earthquake. Uh, Snorlax, hold on because you love me. Oh my god! Oh my god! game ever. Okay. Uh, it's good. That's such a stupid mechanic. Oh, it's a good anime moment. <laughs> Snorlax saved the day and allowed me to become the champion. My work wasn't done yet, though. I still needed a few more key Pokemon, like Spiritomb, Carnivine, and Feebas. After the credits, I re-entered the underground. I found two new NPCs immediately, and was able to catch the Spiritomb with a quick ball. After this, I spent some time catching some stragglers that I missed, like Finneon, Goldeen, Remoraid. Uh, I also bred Burmy to get a male one for Mothim. I visited the Lake Trio, caught Azelf and Yuxi after a few Dusk Balls, and used my Master Ball on the Wandering Mesprit. By the end of the little catching and evolving session, there were only a few Pokémon left and the majority of them were Shining Pearl exclusives, like Bonsly, Glamia, and Palkia. Of course, since I was trying to do this fast, I didn't want to have to struggle through all the battles with low-level Pokémon, so I traded my now level 63 Empoleon from Diamond to Pearl. Normally, with only two badges, a traded level 63 Empoleon should not obey you. But what you may not have considered is that Empoleon isn't considered a traded Pokémon. Empoleon was my Shining Pearl starter. And because the original trainer of the Pokemon is the same, it obeyed my every command. I swept through Pearl without anything to slow me down. Until I reached the Great Marsh. Carnivine. Yeah. Carnivine. Please. Please. Please! No Carnivine. Uh... By now, my chat had told me about this daily 16% chance Carnivine, and I was just hoping it'd be there when I reached the Martian Pearl. It wasn't there. I, I tried changing the system clock on Pearl just to see if Carnivine wasn't considered in the 24-hour time travel punishment. As far as I could tell, it was, so there was no way I could obtain it. I tried different things for over an hour with no success, until someone in chat pointed out something. You need six badges for Carnivine? Really? Unfortunately, well, I have eight badges in Pokemon Diamond. This card. Freaking zooming. Spinning. Oh, okay, we just need to catch it now. Now, I'm not sure if what they said was actually true or not, but because my Pokemon Diamond Clock was wrong, it ticked over to the next day while I was playing Pokemon Pearl. It reshuffled the daily Pokemon in the Great Marsh. And with some incredible luck, I got the 16% Carnivine chance. Back to Pearl, I still needed to get a Palkia. So, I cleared out badges 4, 5, 6, and 7, catching a Bonsly, Glamia, and Perugly along the way. I reached Palkia, and with only Cyrus blocking my path, I lost the battle. And and, and I, had, I had to climb the mountain again. I didn't lose a second time, and Master Balled the Palkia for the final version-exclusive Pokémon. 
I traded all the version exclusives, trade evolutions, and some items over to Diamond for the final stretch. I evolved a few more Pokemon, like Bonsly, and used the Dusk Stone from Pearl to evolve Mistrevis. And then, there were only two Pokemon left. The most difficult Pokemon to obtain in the Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl games. Feebas and Milotic. Feebas works just like it did in the originals. It can only spawn in this lake underneath Mount Coronet. There are about 500 water tiles in this room, and if you fish, Feebas can appear on exactly four of them. Which four tiles? Well, those change randomly every day. The worst part about this is that if you fish on one of those four tiles, it's only a 50% chance for the Feebas to appear. So there's no way to know if you missed them. The only thing standing between me and a completed Pokedex was finding one of those four tiles. So I grabbed a Pokemon with the Suction Cups ability, threw it in the front of the party for better fishing odds, and started fishing one tile at a time. I think you skipped a row here then. And then just on the way back, I missed. Gotcha. First day, that's what he said. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I guess it doesn't matter. So... We got it! Let's go! It was actually the line that I missed. Isn't that crazy? You saved me, Chad. I searched through nearly 400 tiles. But after two hours of fishing, I finally found a Feebas tile and caught it. One... Pokemon left. To evolve Feebas, we encounter an entirely new problem. In the modern Pokemon games, Feebas, it's a simple trade evolution while holding a prism scale. And the prism scale does exist in these remakes. It can be found by digging underground. It's super rare. People in chat were telling me they searched for eight hours and couldn't find a single one. So I opted for the traditional evolution route, Poffins. I needed to feed Feebas dry Poffins to raise its beauty and get it to evolve. I used my Alakazam, which happened to love Dry Poffins, and it had the ability synchronized to force a wild Feebas to love Dry Poffins as well. Now it was just a matter of cooking up a few batches of them. And I'm gonna be completely honest here, this was my first time ever making Poffins, so... Wiki, Orin, Wiki, Kelpsy. Yes. Foul Poffins? You use two of the same berries? Next time I throw two blueberries into a muffin, I'll just chuck it in the garbage. I had no idea what I was doing, so I, I had to reset once or twice. Once I got good enough quality Poffins, the Feebas Beauty was quickly maxed out. I was able to level it up once to get the last entry in my Pokédex and finish the run. It's evolving! Yes! The last one! Wait for it to enter the Pokédex! Milotic! It's so beautiful! And that's time! 151 out of 151 Pokémon! Yo, what's up? Ah, Ant! You've come to show me your progress on the Pokédex. Bro, go to the game director. Wow. You literally complete the Pokédex, and then Rowan is like, Good job, I don't care. These seem like people that work on the game. I'm the game director. Congrats on completing your Sinnoh Pokédex. a little underwhelming, but okay. And that's it. To complete the Pokedex in Brilliant Diamond, it took me just under 21 in-game hours. It was a long, sh short journey, but I pulled it off in the end. If you enjoyed, be sure to subscribe. I play games wrong all the time, uh, but yeah, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.